Hello. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Steve Mann, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's briefing on the uh, Haiti region earthquake. Uh, this is being hosted by the Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Center, the Structural Engineering Mechanics and Materials Group at UC Berkeley and the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute. Uh, the Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Center uh, was formed a number of years ago now, and uh, we have a mission which is to refine, uh, extend, and apply performance-based earthquake engineering ideas and concepts to help improve the safety and resilience of the uh, built, in uh, built inventory that we have that may be vulnerable to earthquakes. Uh, we have uh, done a great deal of work in defining seismic hazard, developing experimental and analytical simulation models for predicting what the future response of structures would be, and a lot of cutting edge research on assessing vulnerability and uh, uh, mitigating risk that uh, buildings have to earthquakes. We have uh, focused a great deal on uh, the type of research that would be necessary to keep our buildings and communities going, as well as some of our great institutions following uh, an earthquake. But sadly speaking, uh, when you look at the last decade or the history of earthquake engineering, that uh, the damage is disproportionately uh, being uh, thrust on uh, some of the poorest countries or the countries which are part of the developing world. And a simple uh, uh, examination of some simple statistics would suggest that while earthquakes have affected uh, developed countries, uh, the United States in 1994 in Northridge, there were an uh, un unacceptable number of casualties. But if we look then at what might happen uh, more recently in the developing world, uh, the casualties go into the tens to hundreds of thousands of, of people. And so uh, in addition to working on issues of modern industrial societies, we need to focus uh, on what happens in some of these other countries where some of the technologies are not as advanced and some of the economic, regulatory, and other aspects of society aren't as well uh, developed as here. Just some examples, 1999 in Turkey, they had a great deal of damage uh, in Bam, Iran, in uh, 2003, again, uh, a great devastation over wide areas. Uh, the great um, Sumatra earthquake in 2004 in Indonesia caused a great deal of damage due to tsunamis as well as to ground shaking, not only in one country, but in half a dozen countries around the Indian Ocean. And lastly, the Wenchuan earthquake of 2008 uh, in China. Uh, resulted in 70,000 casualties, uh, 5 million homeless, and a great deal of uh, dislocation and disruption in the economy. Uh, so when the Haiti earthquake occurred, uh, we were particularly concerned about what was happening there and partnered with EERI, GEAR, and a number of other organizations that uh, did or were doing reconnaissance or starting to do reconnaissance there. But it was our pleasure to know that one of my old colleagues from uh, uh, Berkeley uh, was uh, heading to Haiti the morning following the earthquake. And uh, so uh, we have been helping uh, support some of his activities there. And this is the, I believe, first public technical briefing on the earthquake. Uh, and I'm sure we will have many more in the months to come. But this is our first opportunity to see some of the damage firsthand and have some technical explanation of its background. Um, the speaker today is Eduardo Fierro. Uh, he did his uh, degrees here at Berkeley in the late 1970s and has been a practicing professional engineer since then. At the moment, he is the president of his own consulting company that uh, as the name of Brutero, a distinguished professor uh, emeriti from Berkeley, um, Brutero, Fierro, and, and Perry, a consulting 
earthquake and uh, forensic engineers, if I'm not right, not wrong. Um, so if you would join me in turning off our cell phones, I will in, uh, introduce you to Eduardo and ask him to come up. Uh, good afternoon. I am very happy to be back in the United States after the devastation that I have seen. Um, thank you very much, Steve, for the presentation and for um, you know, the help that um, you gave uh, us to uh, go there. Um, one of the things uh, that uh, Steve uh, said was that uh, this was the first technical presentation uh, of this kind. I'm sorry that you guys are second, but... Uh, I went to see Professor Bartero yesterday at his house and gave him the presentation personally because he couldn't be here today. You know, so you're second, second people. Um, uh, what I want to show you is um, uh, first some statistics and locations, and uh, we'll go quickly through that. Then the first impression of uh, what I saw when I landed in the uh, Port-au-Prince airport and walked through the city. Then you know, drove towards the city and then a walk through the city and then some more detailed uh, view of um, the construction details, the um, other towns that I visited. So I went to see some industries, uh, power plants, two power plants. I went to see the port. I went to see a cement factory and uh, a um, uh, steel factory, which is not a steel factory. It's just a factory that straightened rolls of uh, steel. And, um, and then some of the infrastructure uh, that was destroyed and um, some uh, of the human tragedy that um, you see in this, uh, in this earthquake, which was the most striking part uh, of all of this. Um, um, the statistics are here, 150,000 um, death, you know, 194 injured, 134 rescued by international teams. Very little, you know, 9 million people, 3 million people uh, affected by the earthquake, 1 million displaced people, you know, and, and so on. You know, 235,000 people that have left. You know, the people there were walking aimlessly from one end to the other one, not knowing what to do. Um, and then the children was something that was um, very interesting, you know. The, the, the children were just walking aimlessly in the streets with no parents and, uh, you know. Uh, and then um, the effect on foreigners. You know, I travel a lot. I go to many places in the world and I stay in hotels, you know, the, the top hotels that uh, any uh, city in the third world or in the first world can offer. And um, you never look at the building and say, is this going to collapse, you know. And the Montana Hotel collapsed and most of the fancy hotels collapsed. So there is... Uh, 4,800 Americans that are unaccounted for, and if they're unaccounted for, they're most likely dead. So it affects us as well as it affects um, the people from Haiti. You know, sources of information for that thing was CNN, and the sources of CNN were the following ones. You know, earthquake, it was, um, you know, 7.0. You have seen these things, you know, 15 miles uh, west of uh, Port-au-Prince, it says west-southwest, but it's mostly west, and uh, uh, you can read. That's the one that shows the, uh, I don't have any mouse here because I'm showing the, um, the slide. And those are the aftershocks and the location of uh, Port-au-Prince. Um, the um, falls that are in the island of Hispaniola are the following ones, and uh, um, 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 this is the main fault, you know, the uh, Enriquillo Plantain Garden fault that supposedly ends here, Santo Domingo is here. Um, there haven't been any earthquakes recently here, but I have, a, I have my doubts that this thing will end here. And there's a major fault that goes through one of the major cities of the Dominican Republic, and then there's a subduction fault here. So this island is full of uh, faults that are going to cause earthquakes. Historically, we have had, you know, many earthquakes. However, one of the things that uh, is uh, very interesting is that um, the earthquakes in this area, major earthquake, it was in 1770, I, was, I thought it was 1753, but it was 1770. And, um, you know, these people have earthquakes, you know. 
It's just that they haven't had it recently. You know, the geological times are too small for some of the generations, and, uh, and they have had earthquakes. Intensities is the rupture, you know, uh, on this thing occur from from here to the west. You know, that's what the, the way the rupture. And you can see that the the places of more intensity are to the west. The the other side on the east had very little damage. All these structures that were really, really bad had a little damage. And uh, here in Dominican Republic, Santiago and Santo Domingo fell about 3% of uh, G for the accelerations. Although it was a long, uh, long earthquake and everybody was scared. And thank God that they felt it because I think that they're going to try to start doing something about it. USGS estimates about 30% uh, percent of G for the maximum acceleration. Um, in here, I would say that uh, based on the damage that I saw and my experience on seeing other earthquakes, um, it's a little bit larger than that. You know, Adobe falls at 30% of G. We have tested Adobe, and every time you go to 30% of G, it, it, uh, it collapses. And this was not Adobe, and it's all collapsed, so it must have been something bigger than that. Uh, that's the acceleration and the peak of the spectra at the 0.3 seconds, and that's, uh, you know, 60% of G which I think that is low. Um, this is a comparison of the accelerations from the uh, initial shock, you know, 30%, and uh, for the other shock that was, uh, I guess, 12% was the, the biggest one. That was on Wednesday when, when I was there, but I was driving, so I didn't feel it. And then this is the comparison of the um, uh, accelerations at the, the peak of the spectra, which is, you know, 60%, and uh, I think it says here 24%. Um, then intensities, you can see this was a, a lot of um, intensity here. It was felt here. It was felt here in Santo Domingo. And this, one's, um, this, one, this earthquake on Wednesday was not felt in the Dominican Republic. You know? This is some comparison that we did in the Dominican Republic related to what the USGS says that the uh, uh, earthquake was. You know? And uh, this is the... Um, the Dominican code is the yellow one, and the proposed Dominican code is uh, um, the green one. Um, we think, based on the damage that I've seen, that it, the PGA must have been somewhere around 0 0.45, 0 0.5, and you, the people that have seen a lot of earthquakes, will look at these things and most likely will agree uh, with, uh, with me. So now we're going to go and have a pictorial of uh, landslides, and I've tried to um, show these things similarly to what uh, our reconnaissance reports uh, for ERI or for PEER, uh, show most of the time first landslides. And, uh, but um, so this is a major landslides um, next to the roads, you know, that closed some of the roads. And uh, um, they had, uh, you know, this car was up here and a major landslide. Um, there were um, retaining walls, there were stone walls that uh, failed like that. And this was very prevalent, the fact that the posts that uh, carry the electricity and TV and uh, phones uh, collapse, and uh, so there's no service of that kind. There is a very extensive damage of the infrastructure related to electricity and, uh, and communications, which the Dominicans are um, volunteering to go and do it for free, you know, to fix these things for free. I don't know... Um, how are they going to do a lot of PCBs uh, from the uh, transformers? And um, we saw some of these uh, uh, going down west, uh, several of these ones, not too many, but that was the extent of the uh, lateral spreading in the roads, um, landslides on the road going west, you know, big chunks of the, um, uh, of the rocks from the side, um, and little ones. And that was a big landslide that I have the location, and I, I wasn't able to get there because it was very complicated. Uh, my initial impression is the following. I land in the Port-au-Prince um, airport, walked in without showing any, um, uh, any passport or anything, just walk in, and then the same way we left. You know? And uh, this is, uh, is Port-au-Prince here, you know? so you land somewhere in, in there, you can see the, the airport. I, I, I cannot see it from here. And um, the location is, the, this is Carrefour, which they call them Carrefour. Uh, and um, this is where the epicenter was. And then further west is the town of Leogan that I will show you in a minute. That's uh, the view of the, of the city. 
and there were some tall buildings that I didn't get to see. And uh, so we're getting out of the airport, and there's nothing damaged there, you know. And then suddenly we start seeing the fences. These are um, block fences with uh, uh, little concrete columns. And then you start getting into the city and driving through the city, and uh, you see these uh, um, reinforced concrete buildings with the very small columns, you know, and uh, collapse. And this was not one, but it was like I, I didn't have time to take the picture because click and click, and I was taking pictures and taking pictures of the GPS so that I know where was the location of these things. And it was, you know, just one after the other one, and the people walking back and forth. I, you know, I, I was wondering what were they doing, and nobody could explain what were they doing or where they were going, you know, and. Um, there is all, all of these buildings have people dead inside, you know, there's no, just this building collapse and they come out, you know, and then you can see the little size of the columns. I'm going to go through the details later on, and you can see that some of the details of these things, and that's the slab here, you know, and uh, there's people in here, and uh, the, the second story went, and this is so strange because, you know, this is all open, you know, soft story, and it didn't collapse on the, on the first one, it collapsed on the, on the top uh, story, um, it's the same uh, same structure, and uh, you see these are malls. These are not, you know, buildings that are self-built by people that do not know how to build. This there was an engineer involved here and a and a foreman that uh, or a construction company. You know, so you walk there, and uh, this is a new construction, you know, with a colonial style, and you can see you can see later on. The details of this thing, you know, very little reinforcement. The reinforcement was very little, and the transfer reinforcement was worse than that. You know, so you go and see the uh, the, the damage in this, and I, I'm just going to walk through here. You see a typical detail here. I'm going to show you the uh, the details. You know, I thought that this was damage to this tower, this cell tower, but uh, no, it's just the building was co was collapsed. The tower didn't didn't get damaged. You know. And um, there's uh, you know, some things that this, I was surprised that these tanks didn't collapse. There's non-structural elements and, you know, lost the floor. And this is what I was telling some of the people before, that uh, these are the slopes on the outskirts of port prince going up. There's some part where the rich people live, and then on the same side there's some part in which the poor people live. This is the part where the poor people live. And, you know, you can see that all these um, houses that were concrete block, Houses with columns and heavy slabs have collapsed. You know, oh, I have this thing here, so this is better. Um, the typical concrete details are, you know, this detail. You can see the the, the reinforcement. These are half-inch uh, bars and very poor quality of um, concrete. They couldn't vibrate the concrete. Um, this is not an optical illusion. This is a half-inch bar. And this is a three, three, three eighths inch bars. And that's a quarter of an inch smooth bar with the stirrups that are open. You know, and in order to show you that, yes, it is, that's my finger. I don't have a big finger, it's just a small. And that's the distance for the uh, uh, spacing. The columns for most of the buildings, including the six story buildings, were six by six, six inches by six inches, or six inches by 12 inches with this kind of reinforcement. And um, that's a typical construction. You know, they build the walls first, then they put the form, form work, and the rebar is in, in there, and they fill it. And of course, when they fill it, uh, they cannot compact this thing very well. And you can see in there that there is no compaction uh, of the concrete, of uh, very poor quality of, of concrete. Now, this is an engineer building in the center of Port-au-Prince, and you can see the smooth bars here. You know, there's smooth bars, and there's a combination of smooth bars and deformed bars with no um, uh, hoops in the joints, and uh, many of the, of the constructions fail because of this, uh, the joint fail. Um, the other thing was that many of them, the joint didn't fail, but the plastic hinge got destroyed. That's the smooth bar, and that's uh, the, um, the hoops that uh, that were placed in there. Some it was a very strange configuration of uh, transfer of reinforcement that um, sometimes I could understand, sometimes I I couldn't. I didn't know what the, they were doing. Now you can see here, for example, 
you know, these are, this is the spacing of the, of the hoops, you know, and this is the form bars, this I think are undeformed bars, and corner column without, uh, and you will see this building, this building has a soft story, I think it was a created soft story, so when it shakes, the first uh, story walls collapse, and then it becomes a soft story, and then it, it falls down. Um, that's the typical beam uh, reinforcement, smooth bars and uh, very little, and that's, you know, on the new construction. They were building this thing, and you can see here, you know, the open stirrups and uh, the rebar that was uh, very small, and um, same thing there. That's your wall, you know, your concrete wall that was, your, sorry, your block wall that was built first, and then your concrete column that, of course, since they cannot compact because it's only six inches, the concrete doesn't... Uh, get to go there. Um, a lot of these things uh, that I saw, there's no lateral reinforcement here or very little and also most of the bars were rusted, meaning they used sand uh, beach, you know, sand from the beach, you know, not uh, sand from, uh, from the river and uh, I saw many of, this, of these structures that were uh, deteriorated like that. This is a, a close-up of, uh, of this area. Now, this is a structure that would just call my attention very much, you know. No cracking. There was no cracking, no damage. You know, it's the same kind of construction as the other one. It looks like the people here had a little bit more, much more care about the, uh, um, the concrete. But you see the spacing of the columns. This was a regular structure, one story. Now, one of the things that is uh, very important um, to note here is that this was uh, either destroyed or not destroyed. And, you know, I, I keep thinking, what, what, is, what is happening here? Why are some of them are completely down and why of them are not? And it's because the structures are very brittle. And they're very brittle so that uh, um, if they get damaged, they collapse. If they don't get damaged, if they don't get to the force, you know, then they don't. And I, I was trying to give this explanation to some of the... Um, of the people in the in the present Dominican Republic and tell look, let's put a, 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 a walkway of glass between two supports and let's have uh, somebody that is light walk into this thing and then come back. And then you look at it and nothing happened, you know. It's a complete damage. So if I go and walk on this thing, it will collapse, you know, because I'm much heavier, and then it will be a complete collapse. That's what happens with this structure. Now, this is the palace before. You know, fortunately, Google Earth has these historical pictures so you can go back and forth between the, what, what was the day before and what was afterwards. This is the palace. This is the palace destroyed. That's a beautiful palace, and that's uh, the palace that, was, uh, that we encountered. But, you know, it's, it's not these pictures that are important. What is important is this picture here. This picture here shows what is the reinforcement of those columns. And I, this is an old structure, and um, there were probably no seismic codes at that time either, you know, and um, the quality of the concrete is not that good, and the rebars are minimal. You know? So there's no wonder why this uh, massive structure uh, collapsed, because there was no continuity, and there was no um, uh, reinforcement, you know, lateral reinforcement in the bars. And uh, this is uh, uh, inside Port-au-Prince, you just a block away from the... Uh, uh, from, from the palace, and, uh, you know, everybody, this is a place of uh, handicapped people, everybody could, died there, all the, all the deaf and, uh, and the handicapped people, they died there. But the good thing of this thing is that, you know, the bottom part is collapsed, and we cannot learn much from that, but we can learn from the top part that was not collapsed, you know, and you can see some of the, uh, uh, of the damage in terms of the reinforcing. Um, again, the same structure, you can... Here, here you can see the, um, the reinforcing, and I think I have a better view of this thing, which is the smooth bars with uh, no reinforcement in the joints. And in these structures that were the design structures, this, there was an engineer involved here, you know, this is what happened. In the other ones, you will see that the, the plastic hinge was the one that got destroyed. Um, same thing, devastation. Uh, all along, you know, you've seen this, and this is what you see when you walk. And this is a Dantesque um, scene, you know. No um, 
some of them down, some of them out, people there. Uh, but if you look at this thing, this is how much engineering these people have. You see that cone there? Somebody was trying to put a column on top of this roof to get another building, and the only thing that they did was they put this little concrete cone on top to spread the load you know, and being able to uh, to build it. And so this was these people were trying to put another um, another floor. Now, one of the things that um, I learned from uh, you know studying here in Berkeley and from Professor Bartero was. The, one of the principles of earthquake engineering is to have your structure light. You know, it has to be as light as possible. Well, these people don't have any idea of, of this. They were heavy structures, you know, block, block uh, what they call cinder blocks, you know, that are uh, the partitions. So, and um, that building that you see there is the. This is the details that I was showing on the first floor. And um, you, we saw the details there. There's, uh, I think, two floors that were uh, completely collapsed, you know. And there's the details uh, that I show you, you know. Smooth bars and uh, um, deformed bars. Now, uh, with no, with very little reinforcement. So the, the fragility, the, the brittleness of these uh, structures is the one that makes them uh, come down and not deform. Now, you see these columns? These are six wide by uh, 12 inches, maybe 18 inches. But, you know, there's one floor that is missing there, and we'll see the details. You know, the details of these things is, you know, not enough reinforcement, and you can see that there's one uh, re transverse reinforcement here, and another one here, and uh, you could see them because there was not enough uh, vibration of these things, and then uh, they are up in the um, they were not covered, you know. And that's the joint, the joint between the beam and the column, uh, completely unreinforced and not enough overlapping of, uh, of the steel, you know. And now you can see one of them that was probably the same type of construction, but uh, nothing happened to them, and the same thing. Now, I saw some areas that w did not have any damage, and you could see some areas that uh, did not have any damage. I think that what happened there was that there was an outcrop of rock, you know, and there was no amplification. I am almost sure that the areas that have more damage here is because there was amplification due to soft soils, and uh, it saw an earthquake that was bigger than what was happening in the rock. Yeah. Uh, and that's walking down the street. That, that's a, you know, you start walking away from the palace, and this is what you see. Um, I'm going to go quickly through this uh, because I want to show you the the complete destruction, you know, this is an engineering um, structure in which the, um, the joint and the, and, and the plastic hinge, uh, plastic hinge two inches form and um, new structure, uh, masonry, you know, this is old masonry, a building rubble, uh, masonry in the middle and masonry outside. Um, uh, this is the communications building. This is a, a, a real engineered building that had some kind of uh, columns that were shear wall columns, but um, that's all we could see, you know. So these columns must have come all the way down, but they were um, too brittle to take it. And, and now that building is uh, becoming to be damaged on the first floor, more shear forces on the first floor, uh, and that's, you know, the communications building is here, and that's another building that collapsed. So in this area, you could see more damage. Something must have been different with the soil there because you see this thing that is flat, but you don't see the, uh, the underlying uh, crops. Um, corner build, no, this is not a corner build. One of the things that, uh, you know, I want to show you quickly these things. You know, these are the dead people, the dead people in the street, you know. I, I don't want to show it anymore, but the, the tragedy of this thing was that, you know, three days after the earthquake, the city was littered with bodies and my god we the this was not a, a, a an earthquake disaster which is this was a disaster caused by the construction industry in Haiti you know the construction industry that didn't know how to use codes you know they didn't have any codes and the people that build these things the building in very bad shape these were the people that caused this tragedy and the loss of human lives 
You know, in the past I've told people that where I give talks that, you know, we have to design things and construct things and assume that our children, our grandchildren, and our mother is going to be in this building uh, when the earthquake hits. So we check all our numbers and do a, a proper design to do this, you know. Uh, the cathedral, you know, in Port-au-Prince, uh, those are photos from the internet, but you, this is what, what's left of the cathedral. Several people died here, but you'll see the details, you know, and uh, this is smooth bar, and the hoops on the uh, columns and the hoops on the beams are those flat bars that are used to just keep them together, you know, old construction. You know? And um, this is the area where I was telling you that there was no damage. You know, next to the cathedral there was damage, and then you can see all these buildings with very little damage, you know. You see this building that is the same construction with very little damage. Now, contradictions here. You know, normally we see in an earthquake, we see all the corner buildings gone. That's typical. You know, you go to a, uh, to a city where there was a big earthquake and all the buildings in the corners are gone. Now, this didn't happen here. You know? And I don't know why, you know, but you, know, you have a wall here and you have a wall here. You know? So walls, in this case, resisted this thing and they um, avoid the soft story of the corner um, buildings. You know? uh, now, success story. Big sheer wall here, you know, a big sheer wall here, although it has some openings, and then uh, a sheer wall here. You know, I saw this, uh, uh, this building, and you know, the, con the concrete here was completely undamaged. You know? uh, sheer walls will take the forces. You know? Our wonderful uh, Chilean friends designed with sheer walls. Both of the buildings have sheer walls. You know? In the school, they tell them, use at least 3% uh, or... 3.8 percent of uh, the area of the building for sheer walls in each direction, and therefore you have very little damage when a major earthquake hits. You know, there's a you know a book about the the sheer walls in, in Chile. You know, and you can see building number one, 2.8 percent. Building number two, 4.5 percent of the area of sheer walls as uh, compared to the total area of the of the buildings. You know, and this is leaving. Um, that's a wooden structure you know, in which one of the floors have collapsed. This is the American embassy, completely undamaged, built with the uh, American standards. And, uh, and that's the same structure that I showed you before that was undamaged. And this is generalized damage everywhere. Um, again, a corner, col a corner building with a crack um, wall here and another wall here. So if you put some walls somewhere in the proper position, you will not get this. is exit in Port-au-Prince on street that was completely destroyed. Now, if you thought that Port-au-Prince was destroyed, this is the town that is on the path of the propagating wave. This is Leogan, and there was a lot of directivity in this thing. The, um, you know, this is the epicenter. Port-au-Prince is here. That fell the earthquake very much. And this is Leogan, you know, very far away. If this was 12 miles, this is, you know, much more than that. You can estimate the distance. And um, you walk into this, uh, you drive into this uh, town, and this is what you find. Everything was destroyed. A light structure, you know? Principle of earthquake engineering. Bad construction, all, and, you know, no earthquake engineering done for this, but this was a light structure, you know? So forces are smaller. And then you walk, and every house in this town was uh, damaged. Um, and the same thing, you see the, over and over the same details of the joints, that uh, the columns that pull out of the joints, and um, a wooden house that uh, collapsed, you know, and over and over and over, you know. Um, and this is the municipality, the city hall in uh, Leogan. You can see here that uh, there was a crack in, but this was a very regular building, you know. We aim to make regular buildings. When we make regular buildings, even if they are bad, you know, they behave. So let's design, try to design regular buildings. The architect can tell us, look, I want all this fancy stuff, but the structure has to be regular. You can have all the crazy things that you want in terms of uh, architectural elements so that they look pretty because they have to look pretty. They have to be wonderfully 
pleasant to the eye, but we can put the structure inside that is a regular structure. This is the cathedral in Leogan, a masonry building, that uh, unreinforced masonry, and um, you know the arches are still standing, but the, the whole uh, front with the towers uh, got uh, destroyed, and you can see these heavy structures. You know? Now, why this thing didn't get damaged? You can see, this is a light, this is a light roof, you know? This is a light roof that may be taken by a hurricane in the case of a big hurricane, but in the case of an earthquake, these people have both, you know? Earthquakes and hurricanes. Yeah? So this didn't get damaged. There's a school in Leogan. Um, Anderson Cooper was in this uh, school saying that there were many people dead. Yes, there were many people dead. This is the canopy. Again, a little column with a very heavy canopy. For what reason? We don't know. You know? Why do we have to put a, a very heavy canopy for a parking structure? You know, we can put a light canopy, and if the hurricane comes and takes it away, well, we put another one. You know? And that's smooth bars with no reinforcement in the plastic hinge area. Yeah. And that, we start looking at the school. And uh, here, it's almost all destruction. But I will show you in a minute what happened with this thing. You know? How did it start collapsing? This is uh, you know, one, two, um, three, three slabs that you can see there. And uh, you can see all, all over the place. Uh, people were dead there. Heavy construction, you can see. Very heavy beams and, uh, and heavy slabs that um, were supported by columns that look the right size, but they didn't have the right reinforcement. You know? uh, and you can see also the smooth bars with the hooks. You know? This is uh, the hooks for the, for the bars. Now, the other thing that these things have is that they do the splicing in the joint. So they have the bars that go like this, and they do the splicing in the joint, which is against all the rules for earthquake engineering. You know, and you start seeing these columns that are, are, you know, started breaking at the, in shear at the, very close to the joint. And we keep going, and we see this, and I, was, I know that I was going to see, you can see the, the collapse uh, sequence. And uh, then you see this, and then you see this thing, you know. This column, you know, this floor was up here, and then this part failed, and the thing... Uh, Collapsed because there was not enough reinforcement in the, um, in this case, it's not in the joint, but it is in the um, column itself. You know, and uh, you can see the, the detailing there, very poor detailing, very little steel for the, the columns. And I have, a, you know, the same thing happened here. But this is a one story building, and here you can see what it was the beginning of the collapse. Fortunately, the one story building none of these uh, columns and beams collapsed, but they were the same kind of construction. So we go there and we see a corner column, and then we see what happened here. This was what happened to that other building when it was failing. You know? That's what you see, you know. There was very little reinforcement. These things punch this thing, and the floor came down, and the column stays in that... Uh, um, Punching, you know, in, in that the diagonal shape. You know? So you can see it that if the if it was three stories and more weight, this was would have gone the same way as the other ones. Um, the university, uh, this is the Bientod University. This university was unoccupied. Thank God it was unoccupied. It was not open yet. It was empty, just finished, and you can see those columns that punch the slab were underneath this other column. Yeah. So the thing got displaced and it went on the slab and, and punched it. But you can see the details here. You know, this is the detail of those, uh, of those columns. You know, this is the form bar, um, half inch bars, um, six inches by 12 inches. With Again, you can see that there was not enough cover and uh, they couldn't vibrate this thing properly so that the concrete... Uh, uh, will go on top of the cover. And then you see the details here. You know, there is you know, more bars here, but not many more bars. You know, they have you know, one, two, three, four, five, six bars instead of four. So two extra bars with the quarter of an inch smooth bars. These things had to, um, had to collapse because they were uh, very brittle. You know? and, and then you can see the hooks uh, from the um, beam. Those, that, I think that was a, a beam hook, not a column hook. 
the main port. The main port was a port that had major liquefaction, but major, you know, I've not seen liquefaction like this. This is where the port is located, you know, and here, you see, before the earthquake, you know, after the earthquake. Before the earthquake, sorry, you know, before the earthquake, you see the, the, the pier here, you know, and this part here, and this part was all gone. And there's two cranes, there's a crane here and a crane here, and all this part that is white, you know, all this part that is white is liquefaction. You know, it's sand that came out of the, um, and you will see it in the details here. This is um, the cranes, and the, the, uh, the pier is down there somewhere. And this is what happened on the, when you don't put a, a, a wall, a retaining wall or sheep piling on the side of something that has sand. You know, on, this is underlined by sand, and then they put material that was firm. And this is what you, what you get, the you know, lateral spreading, liquefaction and lateral spreading of the whole port. Yeah. Uh, major uh, destruction of the infrastructure. You know, and there it is, you know, sand boils. All this thing that you saw white, it's like this, sand boils. And uh, this is the edge where the pier was on the left side, you know, and there's nothing there. Um, that's the crane. And you can see here on this truck where the level of, uh, of the water, you know, the water went up, you know, it was all liquefied and then it came down and this is the sand that uh, came out from the, underneath the port. Uh, major liquefaction here, you know, and then you can see you know, all this white stuff here, all this white thing here, the whitest thing, that is uh, liquefaction. This is the port that uh, the uh, U.S. Army was evaluating to see if they could uh, bring things. I look at the port from the side, and there were no unevenness. And you know, I told them, look, I think that uh, you can use this thing because it hasn't fallen now, and <laughs> it would have fallen. Um, so that's more. I mean, this is a little house, an outlook house. And you can see that uh, this was on piles, you know? This was on piles here. But the piles were not attached to the to the house, and so it, it did collapse because, and it's in, it's in good shape, you know, it's a, it's a good structure, you know, if you could straighten it, you know. Um, a dramatic photo, this is from a, um, this is not my photo, this is from one of the people that were, was with me that is a professional photographer, and uh, he took this dramatic photo and said, would you include that? This is the fuel port, the fuel port is something interesting, and you, I asked Professor Bertero if he has seen this failure before. And he told me no. So if somebody has seen this failure before, please tell me at the point where I show it, okay? Um, this is the port. It's there, you know, the fuel port with the, you know, the, 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 t the tanks are here, you know, the tank farm, you know. And this is the fuel port. That's what it is, you know, before. And that's what, uh, you yeah. know. So that's the port and that disappeared. And then you'll see... You know, this is unanchored uh, equipment, you know, and it just shifted. Fortunately, you know, there was a um, flexible connection, so nothing happened to that thing. It was still pumping and working, you know, but we had a problem with the walls. The separation walls between one or the other ones, you know, fell on top of this thing. So we have to take care of all the details, not only the details of the main structure and the main pipes. We have to see what's next to it and go and look at it because this was built afterwards, you know, and that makes your structure inoperable. That tank was just sitting there, and I don't know why it didn't fall. You know, it was just sitting there, not supported on anything. Now, that's a tank that was on a platform. You can see the platform here. So when it started to get in inclined, it put effort, it put the stress on this corner things that fail. And if you can see this thing, uh, if you get closer, the rebar is in the bottom. Yeah. Somebody designed this thing, and somebody had to go look at it. So no concept of where the stresses are. You know? Sometimes we go and say, okay, well, what about the edge distance of the anchor balls? Oh, no, nobody cares about this thing. This is a structure that was not damaged in terms of the superstructure, the steel structure. But you can see that the, uh, the, the anchor balls, you know, the expansion anchor balls, were all 
out. And the edge distance is important. If you don't put the edge distance, then it will go away. The four corners had not in, didn't have enough edge distance, and um, it uh, go. And this is the port that you saw collapse. Look at you look at it from closer, and there was major um, liquefaction of the soil here, and um, that uh, part when all the material went into the ground. Now this is the truck, you know, that is hanging there. Somebody was probably sitting in this truck and. Uh, was very lucky, and I, you know, I, when I was there, I didn't know that the bridge, that the port went all the way to there, that pier went all the way to there, and I told the person, this went all the way to there, that's part of the structure, and I said, no, 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 that's not part of the structure, it is part of the structure, that's how far away. Now, um, there, sorry, there was a lot of uh, um, settlement here, so at this point, they're building this, um, overlay so that they're going to use this port, the other side of the port that was not damaged, to bring the supplies because there's, that's all there is, the other port and this one here. You know, and then you can see this is the part that didn't collapse. It didn't collapse because they were lucky. But these are the piers, and I'm going to go one by one. The piers, you see, the, the steel piers with the caps, and you can see the, the things that are almost ready to go. You know, they're inclined. And the same thing here. This one was out already, so it's, up, it's out in the air. Yeah. And another one. And another one that was inclined. So this was very close to, to collapse. It's not uh, collapse, but it was very close to collapse. And all of them were like this. Yeah. So I took pictures of all of this. There's punching shear on the one that they're going to use. This is a slab that had um, the punching shear. You know, the, the piers are underneath. And there's punching shear here, and that's the type of reinforcement that we have. A mix of uh, deformed rebar, flat rebar, rusty, and uh, so the construction uh, details and the construction quality has a lot to do with why these things fail. Um, now, the fuel port next to the um, electric power plants, um, you know, we have uh, this. Uh, this is before, this is after, and you can see that this was, uh, there's some damage in here that you can see from this picture, you can see the, uh, the, the port that was uh, damaged in this area, you know, more details here. Um, the airport um, is located to where that arrow is showing you, uh, on, the, on the good side of the earthquake, you know, where they didn't have much damage. The tower lost uh, their... The, the glasses, although they were operating, you know, they lost the whole, the whole glass uh, around. And this is the type of damage that the airport had, you know, cracking all over the place, and um, this typical damage and, you know, non-structural non uh, damage to things. Um, electric power plant, um, they have, um, um, I went to two electric power plants. Uh, one was the main one that is shown there, and that's the old power plant. The one on the left that says, this one is a, it's a power plant that you'll, you'll see in a minute. It's a new power plant, you know. This is the old, and um, none of the ceramic fell. None of the ceramic was damaged. I asked the guy, do you have leaks or not? And we normally have leaks on that thing. None of that was damaged. One of the transformers that you can see here was um, uh, out of the rails. Uh, or if, if of all of this transformer, only one fell off the rails. Um, the uh, motor control centers were all unanchored, you know, and the cabinets were all unanchored. And you can see there, uh, and I can show you the anchor here, and this is the detail of just sitting there. So um, they didn't have the, the care to put it there. That's the building itself. You know, it's a building with a block and a steel building. Um, the person that was um, there that showed me the plant told me that it was operational, that they just couldn't start it because... Um, they, uh, they didn't have lines to go out. The lines going out were, and if they started this thing, they will electrify uh, everybody. Um, so this is the damage to this thing. This is the exhaust um, pipes, and um, you can see the, um, the damage. And there were six generators here. All of them have uh, damage of this type, you know, uh, on the wall. Uh, this is, a, sorry, a detail of the, how the transformer is sitting before it falls, 
and that's the one that uh, has collapsed. But, you know, there's no leakage of the, um, because of the slack that they have on the cables, you know, there's required. If you put them very tight, and there's some requirement for the slackness of these things, and uh, I guess they have enough uh, slack so that they didn't fall. And this is the typical damage that this thing uh, had, you know, uh, from the outside. And anchor tanks, those, all these and anchor tanks had no damage. And I didn't see any damage, but I'll show you something that had damage in a minute. You know, and anchor tanks, these are the cabinets for all the, uh, um, the racks where all these um, spare parts were located. They're shambled. The guy that was in charge of this thing told me, I don't know how many years it's going to take me to put all these parts, spare parts. That's the, the generator, the six generators. And this is a cooling tower that uh, the, the, this cooling tower here was at the same level as this one. You know? But it, um, it didn't collapse, but it, it moved about a uh, foot, foot and a half you know, in that direction. The, uh, uh, the bracing, let me show you. This, uh, you know, I found this thing in the, <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the grid, you know, and I said, what is this thing? And this was one of the knee braces that uh, the cooling tower had that had you know, the balls have uh, completely sheared off. So, you know, there's regulations that tell you don't put uh, braces with one bolt. Okay, this is why one bolt, it's not, uh, not good. And then here you can see the, um, the knee brace. And then the, the, it's not a good picture, but that's the best I could do on that one. Uh, and that's the detail of the uh, support. Um, strange thing, you know, um, power uh, broken in the middle. Um, then there was this electric power plant uh, donated by the Venezuelan government to the Haitian government. You know, they're trying to expand their territory. And um, it's next to the other one. You know, it's, that is the plant. And again, there was no um, ceramic failure. I asked the guy if this plant worked, and he told me, we haven't turned it on, but there's very little damage. And yes, they had very little damage. And then I told him, well, well let's see, well, let's see your uh, transformers, you know. And uh, you see the transformer, and you look, nothing has happened. But look at the detail of the bolts. The bolts have pulled. And in all the six transformers, the bolts have pulled uh, something like this, you know. Now, this is a very interesting plant because what they have is they have the control room in a, con in a sh ship container and they bring it completely. And they also have the generator on the uh, container and they bring it com like, you know, this is it. We don't have to assemble anything. We just put it on a pad, you know. So they put it in a pad and they don't anchor it. So it moved a little bit, you know, but nothing happened to them. Um, this is the support that we always complain and... Um, they were not damaged, you know. They were not damaged. I would expect this type of support that is just rubber support, you know. We always say that they've damaged, and this one didn't get damaged. Now, this is a real structure, you know, with no damage. You can see the, the connections with the bolts and the properly done and, you know, the joint done uh, right, you know, semi-right, you know. But it's, uh, it's okay, you know, no, no damage. So... Uh, However, you know, if you don't have a proper cap on top of your diesel um, uh, reservoir, that's the mess that you get. Nothing important, but uh, you know, it looks really terrible. Now, this is the fire, ta the fire tanks, you know, the fire water for the whole plant. Thank God there was no um, uh, fire here, you know, and one of the tanks is okay, and one of the tanks fell down. Now, you can see this was a support. You know, and the other one, you can see the support, and in this one you can see the support like this, and you can see the tank with the two supports that have fallen, and very little reinforcing here. You know, but I don't think that the I don't think that the that the tank fell because the supports fell. I think that the supports fell because the tank fell before, and I'll tell you why. You know, you see very little, and this is the tank that didn't fall. The weld that attaches this leg to this one is just this little weld, you know? And the same thing happens on the other side. You know, you have a little weld here. And on the other side, there's no support, you know? And that's the other side. So there's welds in one side. The thing started moving. It started going. 
and it got unseated from the seats. With velocity, it came down full of water and pulled the um, concrete things down. That's what I think happens here, not that the bottom part fell first, because um, otherwise, if the bottom part fell first, there was no reason for that one to fall, because there were no forces there but the friction forces. So um, what happens when you have a tank that is not attached to the ground? You know, this is what happens. All the um, pipes break. You know, these tanks are difficult to anchor because they're, you know, some kind of plastic tank or um, it's not a metal tank, so they're difficult. You have to put some you know, attachment around and some columns, and so they didn't worry about that thing. Um, this is a tank in which the bolts were pulled. Not done much. They were pulled a little bit. You know. And, uh, uh, you know, but you can see, sorry, you can see here, you know, in here, you can see that uh, they were lucky. These holes were oversized for these uh, bolts and nuts, you know. And so the guy is telling me, asking me, the, the manager of this, what can I do here? Well, we take the bolts out, put a lot of washers, and then put them down, because that's the only thing that you can do with with these things that it must still pull down. And these tanks, they were lucky with these ones because they're designed exactly the same thing as the other one. One part attached, the other one not attached, and, um, and they didn't fall. The water treatment plant, I went crazy looking for the water treatment plant. You know, last time I had a conversation with Peter, and he's telling me why these people, some of these people didn't go to see the, uh, the, the infrastructure and this. So I said, okay, I'm gonna go see the water treatment plant. And I spent like an hour looking for this. So they took me to the water treatment plant. And this is the water treatment plant. It's a hole in the mountain, you know, with the chemicals dumped by hand, you know, open these things. And this is a, this is a water plant, yeah? I went there, Peter, okay? <laughs> Nothing much to learn, but uh, that, uh, and it was built in. Now, this water tank, it's a very interesting water tank. It's riddled with the bullets, you know. There was a fight here between Minestad and, uh, uh, and the people of this uh, city. But, you know, if you put the shear walls properly, you know, this is a tank with some shear walls and some uh, buttresses on the side. You know, this is a four columns like this. And the only damage that you see is that, you know, it moved in the ground, you know. But the tank is usable, you know. And... Um, this is not a joke. In here, I was with this nine young Asians, and one of them started, they speak, one of them spoke English. And they, Can you hire me? No. Can you give me some money? No. So all of them started coming to me for money, and I felt threatened here. This is the only time that I felt threatened here, for the ones that are going to go to reconnaissance later. I felt threatened here. I normally do not, okay? And... Um, so, think, Eduardo, what are you going to do? Come on, boys, let's take a picture. <laughs> so I hugged one, and I hugged the other one, and I gave my camera to my Dominican companion, and we took a pictures, and you see them going like this, and they were all happy, and I said, goodbye, I'm leaving now. Thank you very much for accompanying me to do these things. Yeah? Dangerous situation, okay? Fuel tank farm, this is interesting. You see these tanks? And you see the deformations, you know, I start seeing the deformations of these tanks all over the place. And those are deformations due to the earthquake, you know. And here, you know, wrinkle and wrinkle here and wrinkle over. So I would assume that if we have tanks like this in the United States in the farm tank, we'll probably empty them all and, and make sure that, uh, you know, we don't have uh, something like that. And you see the deformation of this, they were... And Talus like this, and then I kept walking, you know, and all of them were deformed like this, and then I see a double buckling of this thing. You know, I see the buckling in the bottom, the elephant foot, and then the buckling on the top. Have anybody seen these things? You have seen it? Where did you see it? No, no, no. The question, is, I know why it was. You know? <laughs> Where was it? In Paso Robles, there was one like that. Okay, I, I didn't see. This is a change of of the section, you know, and you know, this is the elephant foot and the elephant knee. You know, I asked, I asked Professor Bertera if he had seen one of this. He told me no. That's why, and then you know, Peter has not seen it. So um, it, it's a rare event, you know. 
um, about uh, 30 centimeters. The steel factory, the steel factory is just a factory that straightens steel, you know, and um, the columns, um, yeah, you can see better, you know, this is the image. And the columns were concrete columns, you know, they were, you know, non-ductile concrete columns with a light um, structure that made them, you know, this thing collapse because of that. You know, so it's unusable. You know, and you can see the cranes and the concrete columns that have uh, collapsed in there. Uh, same thing here. Now, you start looking, this is the, the same type of structure with the concrete columns, but they decided to put a buttress here. And the buttress, and then I look at, at the back, you know, and see the back, let's go walk to the back, see what happened with that one. You know, and you see that the details of the disjoint are very poor, you know. You can, the, the, the rebars don't go from one element to the other one. You know? So, and, uh, you know, that's, you know, this is the um, bottom of the, the top of the column, and this is the bottom of the column. You know, you can see that uh, I, I couldn't see much rebar. Uh, yeah. There's no rebars. There's no rebars. Pacha, there's no rebars there. Okay. So they put the column there with the rebars, you know, stick it from the bottom and put the formwork and fill, and fill, and fill it. So, um, yeah. And that's what you see. Now, you see the other tank on the other side? Nothing happened. This is a steel tank with prop, you know, proper anchoring. Nothing happened to that thing. But this is the, the, the level of... And this one didn't break because there was some kind of uh, continuity here. You know? And that's the tank. Uh, no damage at all. You know? Steel tank, full. And you see this wall with the bricks, sideways, the blocks sideways, you know? These are tiny little blocks sideways. I mean, those things had to fall down. The uh, stack, no damage at all. Lots of bolts, you know, and then you see this is the rebar, you know, half-inch rebar that is um, straightened, and that's why they call it a steel factory. And uh, these uh, columns, nothing happened to them. This is steel structure that was didn't have any concrete around or anything like that, and damage. The, um, the crane just sitting there with no hooks. We normally require hooks so that they don't unseat. Nothing happened to this thing. You know? And uh, that's the uh, quarter inch rebar. This building look okay, but inside it's all destroyed. It's just covered you know, with uh, some siding. I went in and the guy that is giving me the, the tour tells me, no, 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 you're going to die. I said, well, it hasn't fallen yet. You know, let me go look inside. And I have some other pictures. This is cement factory. Cement factory people in denial. You know? These people are this is far away, like uh, 30 kilometers from, uh, uh, and um, they had this structure that it was, this is their offices that was not bad, badly damaged. They had some Colombian engineers that had come to inspect this thing and said, this is all fine, okay? There's just very little damage and don't worry about it. So, you know, then we come here, this is their, their port, and this is a port that has, uh, you know, some uh, sheet piling around here that is, filled with um, some film material, and on top of that they put this. This sheet piling opened. You know? It was rusty and it, it opened. And um, so they lost the continuity there. That um, uh, piece of equipment was not damaged at all. It was just uh, sitting there on the rails with no anchorage to the rail. Nothing happened to it. Um, the same thing there. Uh, now, I look at this thing and say, oh, your conveyor uh, failed. I say, no, 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 that's not a failure. We don't use that conveyor. So it didn't fail because we don't use them, you know. It, it was very strange. Oh, your stack failed. No, we don't use that stack either, so it didn't fail. And your tank, you know, this tank had um, the holes for the bolts, but it had, they have installed it only every other one. And you can see here that it had pull out, and, you know, the same thing here. You know, and this thing pulled the whole thing up, the whole Concrete cone pull out. So it's true. Concrete cones pull out. Never thought that uh, it did. You know, um, the um, this was damaged because they used that conveyor. You know, and the slope uh, fell down. You know, and um, it made them collapse. So they have to worry about it. This silos. I wanted to see the silos, and she told me nothing happened with the silos. And I said, What do you mean nothing happened? Your silos are cracked. And I said, No, that's just regular use from the. Concrete cracks this thing like this, you know, and I said, well, I don't think so. I said, okay, well, I told him, well, maybe you know better than I do, and uh, 
I didn't want to argue with this guy. So there was cracking there on the on the top, you know, and uh, um, and this structure was very badly damaged. And I asked him, "Look, this is you know badly damaged, you know." And he said, "No, it's just a little inclined." And uh, that one, that one was not damaged because we don't use them. Okay, so um, the bridges. This is a, a disaster, you know, this is a disaster. This bridge had no damage, but it was closed because the approaches, the approach here had some uh, subsidence. So you see this hole in between the bridge and the road on both sides, and that's what you see. And then I said, let me go and look, you know. This was very difficult to inspect because of the smoke and all this stuff. And then I go there, and uh, I was going to kill one of those goats to take them to the camp, but they didn't let me. The engineers didn't tell me no. And you see the support, and nothing happened to the support. It's completely okay, you know. Nothing happened. It's undamaged. It's an undamaged uh, structure that uh, it's closed. And it's the main road that takes you to, one of the main roads that takes you to Port-au-Prince, you know. Uh, so I went to this other, I'm going down to the west, to Leogan now, and I see this one here, and um, this bridge, and I see this crack, well, you know, one inch, two inch crack, not much, you know. Then I go down and see this thing, and it's a little crack in here, and then I go there and see, uh-oh, look, there's some damage over there. Uh, this one didn't get damaged here. You know, this one, there was some damage. I went to the other side, and there we go. You know, the two uh, sides um, got damaged, you know, the, uh, the corbels, uh, and you will see. Well, there was no continuity of this bar coming anywhere, you know, this, the thing didn't go like this, it just ended there, so it slipped, the, the, the details were very, very, very poor, the same thing with this, you can see the other one, you know, um, here you can see the detail of how this bar has pulled out of the, of the concrete, you know, um, undamaged bridge, you know, I went there, look underneath, there was no damage, so many of the bridges, and we didn't see much uh, damage uh, to the bridges, you know, but what I showed you, I, I stopped at several of them, you know. Um, electrical transmission, very little damage, you know, they were okay, you know. There was one that was, uh, um, you know, these towers that were in a communication tower, radio tower that was tilted. Light structures, these canopies did not feel anything, you know, but one. One collapsed, you know. But this was, some of them are concrete, some of them are steel, um, cantilevers, you know, look at this, you know, same thing here, you know, nothing happened to them, you know. And this one was collapsed, and it's inclined because there was a bus and a tanker, you know, it was loading the, the fuel, and that's the tanker that, I mean, thank God that didn't explode, you know. But, but then you go see the details, and I see this one, I don't see anything here. And I see this one, I said, oh, look, you know, something happened here. Let's look at it, you know, more detail. And it's rusted, you know. So it's so rusted that uh, it, it broke apart, you know. You see that? You know? This was, uh, the bolts are still here, and this section broke. Now, in this, this is the case in one of them. In another one, the size was, the hole was oversized, and the, um, the bolt pulled out. And then there was a, a breakage of the steel section. You know, you see the oversize. Away from the epicenter, this is really away from the epicenter. This is the epicenter here. This is very far away. And um, my camp, the camp where I was sleeping was here. So I had to go by here and see this. I saw this house every, uh, every day, you know, that was collapsed. And I wanted to see what happened. And it was the same detailing, very heavy roof, very heavy structure, you know, with a really poor detailing uh, of, the, of the columns, very little columns. And the fence was something that I saw in Colombia in the beams. There were some beams in the Armenia earthquake that were like this. You know, this is a triangular column you know, with a triangular hoops you know, to save one bar. You put uh, these things like this. Reconstruction. We're reconstructing. In order to avoid people coming in, they put in um, corrugated metal. You know? And I have no problem with this because this is temporary. But this is a reconstruction. 
They're building exactly the same thing that they had before. They're reusing the blocks that they had, putting them there, and putting the same little column with a 3 eighths of an inch rebar and uh, um, things just like that, you know. Tall structures with long period didn't suffer uh, damage, you know. Maybe low spectral accelerations in the high period. Um, amplification due to the soils because there were pockets of areas that were very damaged and other pockets of areas in Port-au-Prince that were not damaged. You know, directivity to the west of the epicenter, you know, the, the cities to the west were more damaged. Maximum accelerations, my estimate from what I've seen in different earthquakes is that it was not 0.3, it must have been a little bit more, you know, somewhere between uh, 0.4 to 0.5. Uh, maybe 0.45. Uh, quality of construction was very poor. Um, and uh, reconstruction happened with the same details. And this is the team that uh, went with me in terms of engineer Victor Suarez. He's uh, studied here at Berkeley. He's an engineer and director of the airport. Luis Peña was a geologist. And Hector O'Reilly is one of the top engineers in Dominican Republic. That's our team. And that's our private jet. Yeah, that was... Uh, uh, lent to us. Um, the um, uh, people in, in Haiti, Ingeniería Estrella was the company, all these people, and I've never felt so small. This, this, call, this guy is called Palito, meaning little stick, yeah? and he was the chief of security uh, that didn't want to smile for any reason. So I had to make him smile, and there is the smile. Um, this is the other people that went with me, and the guy that was here was the guy that take, took the picture of uh, me and the nine, nine guys that were going to kill me. Uh, and this is the cook of the camp, which, um, for the ones that know me, I like to cook very much. And she let me cook in her kitchen. She cooks for 150 people every day, and uh, she let me cook in her kitchen. I was very happy. And two days later, she served the same dish that I cook that night for everybody. <laughs> yeah. And that's it. Thank you, Eduardo. You, were, you got through an enormous amount of information in a brief amount of time. 450 slides. Professor yeah. Rotero told me, you can do it. Uh, <laughs> so I'm told we have uh, somewhere between 250 to 300 people listening in on the Internet. So uh, we have a bigger audience than we have here. But we do have some time for questions, but in uh, respect for the people who are joining by the internet, there's a couple of microphones, so if you have any questions, if you could raise your hand, and then Heidi and someone over here, yeah, yeah. we'll give you a microphone, uh, and you can ask a question. So we have one here in the middle. Here in the middle. Uh, raise your hand, please. Raise your hand. Uh, don't be shy. What advice do you have for people who will be doing reconnaissance in the months to come? Um, don't drink the water. It's the first thing. Be very careful with what you eat. Don't give any food to anybody from your backpack because you will get a mob. One of the engineers that I went with was not experienced at this. So when we were leaving, took his back and started giving things away and he had a, you know, a crowd of 20 people around him. I had to scream at him and tell him, come here, leave these things in the floor. So he left them there and he knew that there was no more. He dumped them. Um, watch where you're staying. You know, look at the building. If you're an experienced engineer, go look at the, if you're a, not an experienced, go have somebody look at the building to see if it's, uh, if it's safe. Um, Find a Creole-speaking uh, person that will uh, uh, interpret for you because even if you speak French, sometimes it's not that easy to communicate with them. You know, um, there's a lot of people that... And we f I found a lot of people in the street that spoke English, and I immediately grabbed them and said, you're coming with me. Here, you know, have, some, have a little chocolate and let's, let's go. Um, and um, do it in the, uh, I mean, you'll probably have to go to Dominican Republic to get into the country. Um, the bus 
cross. So if you go by bus, it will take you about four hours to cross the, the border. That's, I made a mistake to stay there longer than my other friends. And when you, the border is open now for cars, so you can come in and out. But if you're going in a bus, the bus has the rules and you have to stop in the Dominican side and you have to stop in the Haitian side and that takes four hours. Um, besides that, hard soles and you know, hard hats. Be identifiable as an engineer. That's very important, you know, because if you are being identified as an engineer, it's very unlikely that people will harm you. you know? So be a, be a, a kind engineer you know? and don't argue with anybody. You argue with one and you will get an argument with 100 people. So you bring them around and that's, that's my advice for that. Yes? Yes, sir? Okay, microphone. Are there Haitians now in structures that are uh, vulnerable to aftershocks or just uh, potential collapse just because they're ready? No, the Haitians are all, when, when the buildings are um, cracked, I didn't see any. They're, they're living in the street, in the parks, and when there are no parks, they are living in the median of the road. So there's a, you know, an avenue with a road going that way and a road going the other way. And in the median, they have put, you know, their sticks and their, um, and, and their plastic tarps and they're living there. So I, I didn't see anybody. You know, they're, they're very afraid of that. Although there's a curfew, you know, there's a curfew from uh, six to uh, six. So I don't know how people were enforcing the curfew since there were so many people sleeping in, in the street. I got there, you know, after six and then left before dark. I, I actually, another advice is that if you're going to, if, if there's still the curfew, when, if you go, get out of there, not at six. It takes about, it took me about two hours to leave the city once, to leave the city because of the traffic jam. So give yourself a lot of time to exit the city to where you're going or to go to the place where you're staying in the, in the city. I don't know if there are hotels. Um, I heard that there were some hotels that were open, but um, it was very difficult. In the back. Uh, <clears throat> to state the obvious, the people in Haiti are desperately poor. And I saw some evidence in your slides that there were uh, the people building over there were actually recycling materials from different jobs, the limited materials that they have. Then on another front, um, they're more concerned about hurricanes than they probably have been about earthquakes. Um, and one more thing, I think the picture that you sh uh, showed of the person rebuilding right away probably indicates that the people over there are realizing that if they don't do something on their own right now, they're not going to get any help because they haven't gotten any help at all uh, from the government or from anybody else until now. Uh, the question that I have for the engineering community is what, what can we do to try to help them on all these different fronts? Uh, try to teach them about seismic detailing, try to provide funds, try to help them in some way. Because right now I believe that they're completely on their own regardless of all the money that has been pledged or anything else especially according to their own government? Um, one, one of the things that we can do is, um, you know, I'm originally from Peru, and in Peru there was a, there's a booklet that is a cartoonish booklet uh, that depicts how um, things should be built. We, in Peru, um, the main thing that is built with concrete is uh, confined masonry. But it, it's clay masonry, but it's just very similar to this. So. Uh, and there's this booklet that tells the foreman or the person that is doing their, their house, their own house, how to uh, put the rebar, where to put the reinforcement in. And it's in a cartoonish way that it's very easy to understand. You don't have to be an engineer to look at this thing and say, I am going to do it similar to this thing. Even if they don't measure the things, just having the rebar closer, at the plastic hinge, will, um, will help them. So... I am going to suggest, I'm going back to Haiti and I have uh, some uh, friends in the uh, Dominican Republic that are going to try to help there and I hope that uh, Pierre will intervene and will have some um, input on in these things. But 
you know, we have to give them the, um, the, the easy technology to rebuild because they're going to rebuild just like they're doing it. You know? And um, the other part is that uh, I think that if for, for better, for more important structures, there should be a um, attachment to the, um, to, to the given money that they should be built with uh, uh, better standards. Now, you're right, there was no, uh, I think, you know, I normally when I go to the earthquakes, two or three days later you see tents from China, from Cuba, from uh, United States, from Switzerland and Canada. You see all these tents that are just housing, you know, shelter. I, I didn't see any of that thing there because uh, there's, a, there's a perception that the area is a problem area. Because that's why the United Nations is there and the Ministat is, a, you know, they were shooting at each other. Uh, but I saw the people that were very calm in terms of, you know, uh, the only time that I felt threatened was with these big boys because I was by myself, you know. But when I was in, in the plaza, the, I, didn't, I didn't feel that they were trying to attack anybody. But there is this fear of the person that has not been in a third world country, has not seen poverty, has not seen hunger, that is afraid of go in there and get killed. And, and for good reason, you know. It is for good reason that, uh, that they're afraid. But uh, I think that um, they, they can get the things out if they have a little bit more, uh, more guts to get out to the people. Yeah. So, yes? Hi. Um, I'm wondering which methods of building with local materials aside from just reinforcing concrete, do you think are best for them? Repeat your question, please. I'm sorry. Um, I'm wondering which methods of building with local materials do you think are best? They don't have any local materials. Like in other parts of the world, they have bamboo, and they can build with bamboo. Um, in, you know, in Peru, they're built with adobe, and you can reinforce the adobe. But I, I think that in this case, the... The blocks, yeah, they, they have... Yeah, they have the blocks, but that's all there, there is, you know, the blocks. Without, without the steel. Without the steel, you know. So they can build this uh, new housing with uh, the way the Dominicans do it. You know, they put a rebar, they fill the, they fill the one every 70 centimeters, they fill the cell, and they put the rebar. So they can do that. Um, they still need to put the columns uh, at the borders because otherwise the thing, the thing opens and they have to put... Uh, some kind of reinforcement that goes from the column to the wall. So that's the, the, their material. But I don't think that anybody, I didn't see much uh, old stuff. There is some, uh, some uh, vegetable, you know, I don't know what, what it is. I don't know if it's a, a plantain uh, uh, planks that they use to, to build these things. But uh, um, I, there was very little of natural cheap materials because the area has been uh, desolated by, you know, they have cut all the trees, they have, around Port-au-Prince there are no trees, it's just a desolated area. So, so, so there's um, a number of people uh, and institutions worldwide that are working on vernacular structures using locally sustainable materials that are culturally sensitive to the technology that's available. But in some of these, in China and uh, Indonesia, they're working on confined masonry, EERI, as a, uh, an effort on that as well. But I noticed uh, some uh, structures seem to be using some of that technology, but the quality of construction wasn't particularly good. Yeah. Um, Eduardo showed a number of photos of the uh, newer engineered buildings and uh, we were able to obtain a copy of the French building code, which is widely used in Haiti. Uh, but uh, many of the details are exactly what he showed. If he designed it according to the code with hooks and bars on the tension side of a, a beam, uh, most likely. But all the splices are in the connections yeah. in the code. They give examples of good practice. Uh, and this is for gravity load only. And uh, much like many places in the United States historically and in the world they've just simply voted that there are no earthquakes that happen there yeah. and designed only for gravity so part of this is to get a better understanding of what earthquakes can happen 
some education and uh, then training of people and then certainly enforcement regulation of the process. Peter had a question, I think. Peter, you had a question. Always. Please, an easy one. Yeah, this is more for uh, a number of organizations that are right now trying to figure out how to help. Do you have any idea, did you hear, of the number of schools in the area affected and how many of those are damaged or collapsed? Oh, on and the also hospital buildings. On the first part, I think that 90% of the schools were damaged. So yeah. do you have any idea of the number of schools we're talking about? No, I, I don't. But, uh, you know, okay. uh, you know, schools is, uh, you know, if they just build a new... Peruvian model of schools, they will be okay. You know, the, the, the problem was solved in 1999 by somebody that designed the school with uh, shear walls, you know. You know, three foot shear walls by, you know, eight, uh, sorry, it was 10 inches walls in the longitudinal direction and in the other direction it was confined masonry. That, would, that has been solved, you know. We had 2001 and we had 2007 with earthquakes, very strong motion and Structures completely and damaged up to three floors. You know, so that, that if they could just build that, they it would be it would be done. And if if they can build them in Dominican Republic and in, in other places, you know, if they can build them here in the United States like that, then they would be 100% safe because it has the the right standards for sustaining large earthquakes with long durations. You know? So historically, in the United States, uh, seismic protection really started with school buildings with. Field Act following uh, earthquakes in the 1930s, and it becomes a the, the, the most vulnerable aspect of society: children uh, having some place for them to go. But it also becomes an, a, a a center for the community to to congregate around and yeah. uh, for emergency shelters and the like. But it also becomes a very powerful way of educating people, that if every city gets a new school built properly, um, that uh, using sustainable technology and earthquake uh, detailing and concepts in it, that it, uh, it becomes sort of a seed that hopefully will grow uh, uh, throughout the rest of the country. But this is not a problem just for uh, Haiti. Uh, there was an article in the New York Times, I think, the day before yesterday that showed vulnerability school population age uh, 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 citizens in different countries around the world. And there's just an enormous number of uh, yeah. Yeah. children. I mean, many countries have average ages less than 20, and they're all in school. So it's a, a good place to start along with hospitals. Yeah. And uh, hospitals... Um, you know, I, there was one that was uh, operating um, very cracked, but um, uh, most of the medical help was being given in the streets or under tents. So um, I didn't have time to go and see the hospitals. And I only saw some of the industry, the ports. So there's, you know, there's no, there was not enough time, and I hope that I can go and see some of the hospitals and other infrastructure when I go back on mm -hmm. two or three weeks. So there was in the Wenchuan earthquake, the Chinese government, which has uh, authority, goes beyond what the Haitian government can exercise, said that there would not be, there would be no rebuilding whatsoever. And uh, uh, they basically developed a plan. But people were harvesting materials. They were getting bricks and putting them in piles and getting bamboo poles and putting them in piles and organizing them for the rebuilding that was to come. So in the, um, they put them in tents and temporary housing there, which is still not possible. But the immediate emergency response is very important and uh, shows what happens when you haven't prepared for the scale of event that can happen in an area. And uh, the second is in rebuilding. There's many people. Uh, we're hoping to get a presentation here maybe next week by uh, Kit Miyamoto, who is at a meeting of the Pan American Development Foundation. Uh, this past week in Haiti, he didn't get out of the, the, the conference room that he was in, I'm told, uh, to look at the damage very much. But uh, they were sort of trying to plan uh, with the Haitian government and other organizations from the UN and the United States the rebuilding effort. But I think the key thing is 
to make sure that there are seismic provisions in, included in those and uh, that those be enforced, but they also uh, be a certain amount of money for training local Haitians in the principles of earthquake engineering and also uh, new generations of students who can continue on on that and uh, do research for their own purposes there. So uh, Brian Tucker uh, from uh, Geohazards International had a nice piece in the uh, editorial comment in the Guardian in England uh, about uh, taking a percentage of development and recovery funds and putting that into training and research uh, and enforcement rather than just giving money and having people, training, uh, giving people houses but not training them how to build houses properly. It's a major task, you know. This is really, yeah. Uh, Doug, uh, if you could wait just a second. My, microphone, thank you. I was wondering if there's any evidence of uh, surface slip along the fault. I went looking for the uh, surface fault because I was with a geologist, and um, I couldn't get to the place where there's falls, where I was asking everywhere, and hopefully, you know, that is going to last. That's going to stay there. So hopefully next time I go, somebody else, the, some of the other teams that are going will look at it. I looked for it, but I, you know, I kept asking, and this was all, a, where is this place? And <laughs> Over there, over there, over there. So I have my GPS, and I knew where the epicenter was, and, but I couldn't get to the, to the place in the time that I had. So I, we, we didn't see it. And uh, there, was no re there, were, there were no engineers or geologists in the field when I was there. It was, you know, it was me with the people with my high hats and nobody else. You know, it was just uh, everybody's just walking from here to there. There were some doctors that we saw, but no engineers at that time. So hopefully some of the ones that go now will, will look at that. Okay? Sorry. Is there any uh, code regarding setbacks from faults? And do you think there's <laughs> any possibility? No, not even here. You know, we have the stadium that uh, the fall <laughs> goes through. <laughs> No, no, there's not. Sorry. From what we understand, there's no code that's mandated by the government at all for construction, but it is generally up to the engineer to pick the code that they're going to use. So if they were educated in the United States, they may use a, a CE. If they were educated in France, they'd use the French code. If they were uh, from someplace else, they would use whatever they thought was their professional obligation to do. And, No. no, exactly. No. So I, I, that I don't know. The question was, is there a requirement to use an engineer uh, by Steve? And uh, there was not. Now, um, the, the other thing, but not going, not going far, you know, Dominican Republic is next to it. And Dominican Republic has a code, has a seismic code, 1979. They're going to publish another one that was written in 2008. It was commended by me and Professor Bartero. And they're in the process of getting it. But that only includes buildings that are... Um, above four stories. So buildings that are four stories and below are not required to have any seismic requirements. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, you, don't, you build it and not required. Yeah, so it, the Dominican Republic, yeah, the Dominican Republic has the code that five floors and above, you have to use the code. And the other one, so schools are all, you know, free. Anybody can do them with whatever, with whatever uh, code. Yes, sir. Uh, wait, hold on. Hold on. Do you know what the design wind speed is there? Ah. There's no code. Uh, there's no code for. Uh, there's not. It's not in that Haiti? there's not in an Haiti? earthquake code. There is no code. We're, we're, <laughs> we're talking about Haiti. No, no. I don't think that there is any. Uh, I, I know so, that the Dominicans in 1943. Um, were ordered to put rebar in their concrete block because of hurricanes. And that helps their seismic part for the buildings that are from one to four stories. You know? But, um, and, you know, yeah. but I think 100, 100 miles or something like that, you know, it's, I mean, that's in the Dominican Republic, but I, that's why they have heavy structures, you know, because of that. Question over there? Hi, thank you and welcome home, by the way. 
Thank you. Uh, California, of course, has its own share of non-ductal concrete building stock, some of which I understand, according to a 2002 report from the state of California, has deemed some five or 7,000 K through 12 public school buildings as posing life safety hazards. Uh, is there any reason to believe that our own non-ductal building concrete stock won't respond as, as shown on your slides? I don't think so. I think that the, the quality of the construction is better. You know, they probably have uh, um, the form rebar, but if uh, in concrete, you know, everything is the details. Yeah? Everything is the details. So if you have non-ducted details, you know, you are going to have some of them catastrophic failures. Some of them are going to be damaged beyond repair. But there is the possibility that for a non-ductile um, uh, reinforced concrete uh, building that you can have a collapse. I mean, there is no, we have tested, you know, Peer has tested, you know, the non-ductile columns. And as soon as you get to certain small deformation, you know, the column, you know, there's a, a shear pain that occurs, and that shear pain just slips, just like I show you in the uh, in, in this photo. So um, I don't think so. I mean, the the, the schools, you know, the, school, the, the old schools in Peru were non-ductile concrete. So what was the solution? You know, the windows, the short columns, fill two spans, fill three spans with brick. And if you fill them with brick, then you have brick from top to bottom. Yeah, and you don't have the, the short columns, you know. Oh, but the light and this is, put a fluorescent light, you know, instead of killing the, the people there, you know. So I think that um, there could be some cheap solutions for uh, immediate, uh, immediate rehabilitation of buildings that do not require, you know, extensive, uh, extensive uh, um, work. You know? Cities like uh, El Cerrito and Albany here, had non-ductile uh, concrete uh, frames, and they destroy them completely and put a, another steel structure in, on top of it. So, uh, so, uh, so in the 1989 earthquake, there were some reinforced concrete bridges that collapsed in the Bay Area, and in 1994, <laughs> there was a, a number of reinforced concrete buildings that collapsed. Uh, part of this is how severe the earthquakes might be. We had a magnitude... 6.5 earthquake on January 10th in Ferndale, uh, Eureka, uh, where the ground motions were in the same area, somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of gravity, and there was mo relatively modest damage, uh, including a, a number of unreinforced masonry buildings that were shaken. Um, some of those had been retrofit, some of them hadn't been, but as Eduardo said, there's Many of these buildings are very good up to the point where they're not good at all. Yeah. And, uh, and so uh, one of the things that Peer has been working on is that when you have 8,000 or so buildings that are considered to be vulnerable, you can't necessarily afford to fix them all, but you need to be able to detect the most vulnerable of those and the ones that are the least vulnerable to set priorities. And that's one of the key things that Peer has been working on and currently has a program to do that and working with engineers to develop uh, retrofit and re uh, methods that will work. Cam the Berkeley campus has a very active retrofit program here, so it's a very good, uh, not museum, but laboratory for looking at repair techniques that can be used for uh, non-ductile uh, reinforced concrete frames. Uh, you can walk over to Davis Hall and look at one up close. You can work at the corner of Hearst and, yeah. uh, so, and, uh, and Oxford also. There's a building that was non ducted and they put f four walls in each direction, and so that's it. There's a question in the back. Another question? There's now uh, research institutions that are sending teams over to Haiti to evaluate what actually did happen over there, and we're going to have great information coming back. Um, it's a blessing that we have that information because we learn a lot from that. But are there any teams of engineers that are actually helping the local population with regards to assessment of existing structures or how to shore them up or how to uh, maybe repair what is there? Is there any help to the people themselves at this point? So not, just go, not engineers just going there for research, but actually to help the population that needs the help. 
there, there, there's a, the, I think that there's a team from uh, um, New York. M the, M MC, MC is going along MC, with providing MC engineering. MC providing engineer assistance. You know, there were four engineers that went there as an advanced team, and their objective was to um, provide um, uh, evaluation. Four engineers for that disaster is nothing, okay? And what, what these people need is, you know, a thousand engineers to go there and do these things. But a thousand engineers that know what they're doing uh, it's very difficult to find, you know. It is not, it's not an easy task to, you know, find a thousand engineers that uh, can look at the building in an hour because that's what you need to do. You have to look at the building in an hour, look and decide, yes, this is vulnerable or no, this is not. And of some of them you are going to miss, but uh, you need, uh, you know, engineers like uh, the people that have seen a lot of uh, earthquake damage, you know, Steve and... Uh, uh, and, um, uh, and Greg and uh, the, the people that have been in this business for a long time, but that's a lot of money, you know, because going there, you know, it's going to cost uh, between 150 and 200 dollars an hour for engineers of that calib caliber to go there and uh, and uh, and do the work that they have to do. You know? So. so it is, it is a main, major problem in that. I believe the group that went is the Appropriate Infrastructure Development Group, AIDG. Does anybody know? Mm -hmm. And so um, you can look at their website, and that's a way of volunteering. Um, the real dilemma is that you have to have then train engineers and who are familiar with local materials and can speak Creole. Um, the other side of it is if you're interested in this type of thing, there's a couple of other groups. Uh, one is Build Change, which is um, headed by Elizabeth Hausler, who was a Berkeley grad from uh, seven or so years ago, who's been working in uh, Indonesia, Peru, and now China uh, uh, using uh, masonry, confined masonry Combined. construction and a little bit of wood more recently. Uh, but I think in the two years that they have been in China, they have done maybe 500 buildings out of 200,000 that you know were demolished. And so part of that is work with people one by one, starting at the grassroots roots. The other is to work from the other end, from public policy, and come down. So um, there's another group called Geohazards International that works very effectively with national governments as well as local engineers to develop better uh, uh, policies and implement, try to implement those in the field. There's a question up front, Heidi. Thank you. Um, I I was just curious, and you may not have the experience to be able to give a complete answer, but I was wondering about in the case of the residential small vernacular buildings for the poor or middle class there, and the impediments you might see to implementing a better construction, such as, and all has to do with cost, I guess, but it might have to do with the, a better code that is easily uh, uh, disseminated availability of materials, um, cost of materials, and tradition of building. And I see, for example, that they were using um, not crushed aggregate, but just a river rock there in the concrete um, aggregate. Um, so I was wondering if you had any thoughts about that. Well, you know, I, I don't think that um, the, the codes, you know, giving them a better code and giving them a better design is, is the answer for this you know, one and two and three story buildings. I think that, as I said before, this booklet that is a cartoon booklet on what to do, how to build, it's, in my opinion, the best way to deal with this problem. That was exactly my yeah. question. Yeah. 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 Give, them, give them this booklet that tells them, I mean, there's no design, you know, there's no design involved in this thing. They just have to build it according to certain standards, you know, put your columns this big by this big with your hoops this big, your steel, you know, instead of three-eighths of an inch, you know, five-eighths of an inch and this type, and this is the way you join the brick with the, the block with the thing, and this is the what you put in the joint and put enough walls in this direction and in the other direction. That booklet has all of that spelled in a way that um, 
anybody can understand it. There's, you don't need to be an engineer because it's in a cartoonish way. Dig your hole, there's a guy digging the hole there, this much but this much. Put this type of material there. So I think that for that type of building, this, that would be the best, uh, um, the best way to deal with that. You know? So but then, so this, um, for this part of the uh, built um, en environment there in, say, uh, in Port-au-Prince, um, the best thing is to ignore any question of having to wait for the government to adopt a code and then enforce it, to bypass all that and much more effectively simply uh, set aside any question of having an engineer or an inspection and just provide the simple booklet that everyone could understand. It could be uh, and well, no, not only provide a simple booklet, but uh, it has to be the simple booklet so that they can do it right. But if there's no enforcement, no oversee by some authority, they will not do it. So you have to give them the, the, the booklet, but at the same time, you, know, you can do it yourself. This is the way to do it, easy to do it, but you, know, okay, so you, you, have to, you have to enforce it some way. You know. I, I come from a country you know, in which if there's no enforcement, you know, <laughs> and I was talking with Professor Bertero, and he's telling me I was an inspector in Argentina you know, a long time ago when I was young and I still live in Argentina, and I went to the construction site, and the rebar was there, and uh, as soon as I left, you know, I knew that I had to sneak back because they would take the rebar out. The rebar was there so that uh, I, I was an inspector and I was able to see it. But then they will untie it and take it back and pour it. And so enforcement is, it is a, a very important part in a place where um, economic necessity is uh, very big. You know? There's places in, in the world that uh, they steal the copper wires from the transmission lines and sell it in the market. You know, so you can see you know, yeah. they go up there and they risk their life and cut the copper and you know, roll it and, and take it uh, to the black market. So, so uh, The country is called the United States. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, there, there, there are some very nice things that EERI is doing with the World Housing Encyclopedia, putting together some of the technologies that different countries use for this. Uh, but generally speaking, there's a number of guidelines that well-meaning engineers uh, suggest to people, but very few of them have actually been validated. And so there's, there's sort of a, a whole combination of things that need to be done in terms of developing standards and guidelines, cartoons. Uh, but there's an aspect of sociology and cultural anthropology of going out and finding out how you get people to do things and a little bit of marketing or advertising uh, and so on. Uh, but uh, I teach wood construction in the, in the United States and when I uh, do things for contractors, it's better to show them a, a picture of when they do something and when they don't do something than to give them a thick volume of uh, engineering specifications because they think you're sort of an idiot and they've never seen any problem. But if they can sh show them a photo of here's a column with ties at this distance and here's one which is done properly, they know why it's being done and then they will generally try to do things well. And so what has happened is that there's been so few resources put into these types of structures that are built in the developing world. Uh, not enough resources in the developed world, for that matter, but even fewer for the developing world. And so part of my introduction to Eduardo was simply to point out that these kinds of things, uh, Haiti is a, definitely a tragedy at many, many levels, but uh, it's not a unique tragedy. If you look at BAM and China and Indonesia, um, uh, various places in uh, Latin America and, and uh, uh, even Europe, um, Turkey and so on. Uh, it just repeats over and over again. But each country uses slightly different materials. There's no sharing at that level. Professors working on high-rise buildings get together around the world and share ideas. But the local bricklayer in Haiti never talks to the bricklayer in Peru, never talks to the bricklayer in, in, in China so that they can build upon one another's experience in earthquakes. So how many of these earthquakes do we need before we actually have someone, and I don't know who that is, step forward to try and solve these on a global basis? 
We'll do it this time, Steve. So uh, maybe this is our chance. Yes. Uh, with respect to, you know, the, when we talk about the non-proven technology, sorry for sure. uh, contradicting you in this case, but, you know, the, the pamphlet that uh, Marcial put together, yeah. you know, we have, a, we have a rivalry with, uh, you know, I'm from Catholic University in Peru and there's the National University. So the National University said, oh, this guy from Catholic University put this thing together, we're going to prove that he's wrong. So they built the house with those standards, you know, and push it, and it took one G to start pushing it. So, you know, they were very disappointed that uh, the thing worked, but at the, at the same time, they were very happy that at, at the end they took the credit to proof that this thing worked in terms of um, pushing the thing to the right and, and not having a brittle structure because it had a long, uh, a long um, plastic uh, thing. So a test has been done for these little pamphlets and these things. But there are some simple things. One of the things I, I understand Elizabeth Hausler does is bring all the local contractors and masons together and have them build things the way they would want to build them. So relatively simple things and then builds them another way uh, that she's recommending and then they do a, a test with yeah. truck jacks. And one of them is very simple. Of You're supposed to, when you do masonry, wet the brick so that the brick doesn't... Uh, absorb all the water out of the mortar when you're building it and so masons never do that in many countries because it takes time and the bricks are heavier and they see no reason for it so you build something and you, you build a little bridge uh, like Eduardo said uh, not out of glass but out of brick turned sideways and you do it uh, with the moistened uh, mortar after a few days and one with a dry mortar and you, look at the, the, the lightest one and ask him to stand on them and increasingly get them to do it. So it's sort of a, you know, an educational process. It's not an engineering, in this case, it's not an engineering problem. It is a, uh, uh, a sociological, educational, political science, anthropological problem. I was, a, I was taught by, by my, the first house that I built in Peru. The foreman told me, come, come, here, learn. You had to wet the brick before you, <laughs> you put the mortar. I said, oh, they didn't teach me that in the university. Yeah, but they didn't, you know. It's just, you know, I was a civil engineer that can stamp buildings up to 30-story buildings or 50-story buildings. But the guy, when he wetted the thing, said, you remember that thing. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, I, we start at 10 minutes after the hour, but we try to stop promptly on the hour. So... I'm sure that Eduardo will entertain a few more questions by those of you who are here and those of you who are joining us by Internet. Uh, perhaps you can send him an email address. I believe his email is in the EERI directory, and if not, we can uh, maybe post it someplace. Um, he's only in town for a few days and then heading off on another trip that uh, he had scheduled before the earthquake happened. So he was only around for a few days, so we thought we would have him come by and uh, give us the benefit of his experiences there. And as was noted, uh, there'll be many other people going to look at geotechnical and seismological and engineering aspects of the earthquake. We'll hear a lot more, but this sort of gives us an idea of what uh, we will see in, in the future. Um, encourage everyone to make the donations to the uh, relief uh, organization of their choice and perhaps consider giving donations similarly to technical organizations that are going to be helping redevelop the engineering, architectural, and um, government regulatory frameworks uh, to get Haiti back on its feet. Anyway, thank you for your attendance. Thank you for uh, all of you joining us by the Internet for uh, 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 watching today. And thank you, and uh, have a safe trip home. Thank you. And